Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs. Okay. So please join with me in welcoming Jim Allison. chance to uh, participate in this uh, important dialogue uh, in the youth in China and in Australia. Um, I, today I would like to share with you uh, and give you a brief introduction about China's environmental challenges and also share with you some of the efforts made here and also some of the thoughts about how the young people in China and in Australia can help with this pollution control efforts, ongoing efforts in China. The last 30 years have seen tremendous growth uh, in this country. Uh, the economic, the breakneck economic expansion have benefited, benefited our, our country, uh, benefited society and the economy. But in the meantime, it has put massive pressure on our fragile environment. Um, it has forced the uh, ecological degradation and also the, 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 the fast uh, extraction the fast uh, exhaustion of our resources and also the pollution discharge have been increased uh, substantially. Taking water as an example, uh, the amount of wastewater continues to, uh, to be dumped into our river and lakes, uh, causing serious uh, degradation of our water resources. Um, in 2006, according to government statistics, about 60% of the water resources, the rivers and lakes, have been degraded uh, uh, seriously, have been con contaminated seriously. And in, in some regions, it's even uh, more horrific, horrific. For example, in this area, it's called uh, the, um, the High River Basin. Uh, this is an area with uh, 80 million residents. But in, in this whole area where Beijing, major cities like Beijing and Tianjin are located, about 60%, more than half of the of the rivers and lakes have been degraded to a level that, you know, according to our local standard, it's good for no use. It's good for no human use. Of course, fish cannot survive in those rivers as well. And um, all this pollution problem, obviously, will have serious consequences. And the number one concern is the public health impact. Um, when, when 300 million rural residents don't have access to safe drinking water. When half of the urban population exposed to badly polluted air, and plus that when 12 million tons, 12 million tons of food crops contaminated by heavy metals each year, there will be health consequences. When we dump over 30 billion tons of all this waste water into our coastal seas, and all this fish and shellfish, you know, eventually will come back through the food chain will come back to, to harm the human health. There will be health com consequences. And the, and the second impact could be the exhaustion of our resources. Uh, the, the limited clean water resources in China are destroyed by all this wastewater discharge. In China, we have two thirds of our cities in shortage of water. This city is in the epicenter of this water shortage. And at this moment, two canals, each of them 1,200 kilometers long, are being transferred, are, are being built for the transfer, transporting of, uh, of water from this Yangtze River Valley into this North China to bail out this whole region. So when you, when you open the tap in this city, keep that in mind. You know, it's a, it, it, it comes from a very serious social, economic, social, environmental consequences. For example, the, the mid road will, of course, a, generate a relocation of 300,000 people need to be relocated to, let, to leave away for this, for this uh, water transfer from the south. And, um, and, and social stability is another concern. When all this you know, water shortage and uh, pollution and, and all this heavy metal pollution from the factories and industrial zones, will destabilize, will cause all this collective incidents all over China. And um, uh, finally, last but not least, the, the, the impact on our e 
international relations, uh, China's whatever, so-called peaceful rise, or just uh, being, if China want to be integrated peacefully into the global community, this is part of the, now it's regarded as an obstacle. You know, climate change, but also the pollution problem. Pollution knows no boundary, that's the, that's the fact. And with all this serious concern and with the rising public awareness, the Chinese government have changed rules, have changed its strategy and policy, and has created a, a new strategy called the, the scientific outlook of development. It could be translated simply as, uh, as more balanced and more sustainable way of development. And to put out that into implementation, China has, the Chinese government have set goals for the first time, set goals, set environmental targets in the 11th five-year plan, which started five years ago. Now this is the last year for us to achieve this goal. This goal means, says that China is going to improve our energy efficiency by 20% in five years of time, and cut pollution discharge by 10% in five years of time. This is, this is very, very challenging, because this country, the economy is growing almost like a double-digit speed. So this is argue better. You know, now we are on our way to, in theory, to achieve that. But in reality, we still haven't seen our water being cleaned up. We still haven't seen the air being cleaned up. So there's a lot of, there's still a lot of work to do. What are the gaps? There are still major gaps in our governance structure. You know, one of, to name a few, one of the major ones is the enforcement. Uh, professor talks about this, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the the environmental legislation in China. We have seen a great leap forward in our environmental legislation. 29 major laws have been, have been enacted by our National People's Congress, but how many of them are being enforced? All these standards we copied from the Western country, how much of those have been really, really put into implementation? So weak enforcement remains to be a problem. Our court at this moment still not ready, not willing to proactively get involved in handling environmental cases. All this won't change overnight, but our environment, can, our environmental challenges, you know, our environmental situation cannot wait. So with this in mind, there's a growing understanding that we need to generate some motivation from extensive public participation. Even the government recognized this point in China. So with that in mind, the government has created laws and policies to facilitate public participation. The first ever law which requires public participation in public decision-making process happens to be an environmental law, the Environmental Impact Assessment Law. And uh, that was in, came out in 2003. And last year, oh, the year 2008, we have seen the first ever Sunshine Act for the Environmental Information Disclosure Measures which requires the government to, to give 17 categories of different kind of environmental data to the people. And with all this, based on all this legal framework, we as an NGO have decided that access to information should be the, the precondition, should be the first step for, for facilitating public participation. So when we, after we set up, right after set up in the year 2006, we have created a database called China Water Pollution Map, uh, a national water pollution database to give people access to water quality data, the amount of discharge, and a list of violators, of polluters, in all the 31 provinces and 300 cities in this country. What we found is that when we issue this, when people access this information, some of the polluters who used to pay fines year after year without solving their problems started feeling the pressure and they came to us. They came to us to communicate and we pushed them to take corrective actions. And when, when we look at the first 100 companies coming to us, we found most of them are multinational companies or they're joint ventures or subsidiaries because they are, they are somewhat more sensitive to this name and shame game. But not the local companies, not the Hong Kong, Taiwan, or even Korean companies. How, how could we reach them? We believe we need to extend our user base. We need to instead only have the media using our database, only have the NGOs, the researchers, and also some of the communities using this database. We need to have